Beginning with influential free thinkers like Benjamin Franklin, editorial cartoonists have formed an important cornerstone for this country's freedom of speech and expression. Andy Marlette has built upon that right to explore poignant issues such as environmental concerns, economics, politics, and human rights with playful wit and engaging drawings. His most memorable cartoons delight and educate viewers through caricature, irony, analogy, and exaggeration. The most successful of these drawings create meaningful dialogue by disarming different points of view through humor, historical comparisons, and compassion for community and other. The Seligman First Amendment Lecture Series aims to promote free discussion, understanding, and friendship among our fellow citizens. We hope these events serve as a guidepost for civil discourse, honest reflection, and as a reminder to remain lighthearted. <laughs> to kick off this round of robust discussion, please join me in welcoming Andy Marlette. Um, uh, yeah, thank, thank you all so much for coming, and uh, you know I gotta give great thanks to uh, President Saunders and UWF and uh, uh, Art Gallery Director Nick over here, who who for having you know, a little bit of uh, spark and willingness to put political cartoons on the walls of a classy place like an art gallery. <laughs> um, it ain't every day that happens, so. Um, but, but on behalf of cartoonists everywhere, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, uh, you know, I also have to thank my boss, Lisa Nelson Savage, for uh, always being a brave and supportive editor about this stuff that we do. Um, it, trust me, it would be very easy for her to fire my butt and just you know, do away with a lot of headaches and a lot of phone calls and emails and complaints. But, but. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But you know, she, it's, it's, it's re genuinely valuable that she lets us take risks and try this stuff out. And you know, not just Lisa, I've had some great editors over here from Tom Neinstein, who when he was our opinions editor, and, and Carl Wernicke. I mean, you know, they've let us take chance, and, and Lord knows all these things don't hit or even make sense every day. But uh, uh, it's, it, it's, it's worth something that they're confident enough to let us uh, give it a shot. So you know, I appreciate them. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> All right, so, it, it, you know, it, it, we are living in these days where journalists are labeled enemies of the people by the most powerful government authority figures in the world. And, uh, you know, so perhaps it's ominous or, or, or maybe even appropriate that, you know, this building was a former jail. <laughs> um, yeah, but, you know, when folks ask you what, what inspired you to become a cartoonist, I always tell them that, you know, my mother's, my dear, sweet, suffering mother is probably just glad that I'm not in prison. And, uh, and, uh, but look, we made it, Mom. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, uh, so what I want to do tonight is a little bit, you know, regular P&J readers might know uh, my, my wonderful wife, Delonica, in the back. <laughs> uh, we just had a, we had a <laughs> Sorry, sorry. We just had a kid. Yes! Yeah. So about seven weeks ago, he's in the back, so if he starts crying, we'll really know I've, you know, lost the audience. But, uh, um, you know, so, so, so what I wanted to do is, is sort of, um, uh, at first, as a joke, I thought, uh, his name is Whalen, so I thought it'd be funny to do a talk called uh, Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up to Be Political Cartoons, uh, and sort of warn him against going into this line of work and all the rough and tumble business of, of insulting powerful people. Um, but, you know, honestly, I'm very lucky to be in this business, and uh, especially these days when political cartoons are, are, are pretty much an endangered species in this country. Um, I think a, a recent Politico story after the New York Times, you know, booted their guy, um, uh, uh, said it numbered the daily staff editorial cartoonists, you know, sort of who have positions like I do, 
uh, like somewhere in the 30s oh my God. Uh, nationally, that, which is insane. I mean, in the early 90s, I think it was in, you know, over 200. Um, but, you know, as, as newspapers cut back, they looked around the room and, and, and looked at the moron drawing pictures in the corner and like, yeah, we'll get that guy out of here, you know. But, um, uh, but there were literally less cartoonists than there are Florida Panthers. And, uh, <laughs> so which is why my wife and I started a breeding program. <laughs> conservation efforts. Um, uh, but you know, so but in light of all that, I, th I thought it might be a good idea to sort of write a letter to young Whalen. <laughs> sort of, uh, sorry. Explain it. You know, having a kid, you know, I don't know what it does to. You. <laughs> <laughs> but sort of explain to him what we do for a living and uh, why we do it, um, especially in case, you know, this line of work isn't around, you know, when he's old enough to read the paper. So if you don't mind, uh, uh, I figured I'll, I'm going to share this letter with you. And uh, I promise it's funny. It's saying I'm not going to get all weepy anymore. So, uh, dear son, I'm writing to give you fair warning about Potential, a potential genetic condition that runs in our family. It's called political cartoon. And you may be at risk. Oh. Now we can just show baby pictures all night if you want to. <laughs> this is political cartoon. Uh, you also share the DNA of many sweethearted, insane people, everyone from school teachers and basketball coaches to home builders, mortgage industry, number crunchers, guitar pickers, blueberry farmers, sailors, and war heroes. Most of your kin are very productive members of society who get along with authority and are not known for their antisocial behavior. But then there are a couple cartoons. So in, in full disclosure, you hail from a line of doodlers, scribblers, and dastardly picture drawers that have that have been known to stir up a slight bit of controversy from time to time. So I, your father, being one of them, but your great uncle Doug Marlette was the original and one of the best American cartoonists in the business. Yes. Thanks. Uh, he drew cartoons making fun of presidents from Reagan. Deficits are forever. To Clinton, the official seal of the president. And he even called out crooked Hillary before it was cool. This is all pre-Twitter. He poked fun at the Pope. Declaration, no women priests. And he did not shy away from the sacred. Here's Mr. Charlton Heston. Because he always took aim at those who were self-serious, self-righteous, and just plain full of shit. <laughs> I myself, for better or worse, have tried to carry, follow in this line of work and carry on the family tradition of pissing off people in power. Uh, I've drawn cartoons, of course, that make fun of the current president. No. I am not a croc. <laughs> the Lion King. <laughs> Take me to your tweeter. <laughs> So a side note, the, the, the main problem with the president is, is I can't draw fast enough these days. <laughs> but and despite accusations uh, against your father, son, that, you, that he's a radical, liberal, pinto commie, uh, I've made fun of politicians on the other side as well. We have the Clintons. I did not have textual relations with that email account. <laughs> That's my girl. <laughs> President Obama, loaves, fishes, and morning after pills. <laughs> the savior. And 
Vice President Biden. It's not creepy. Biden always reads the mail man like that. I also once drew a picture of a horse riding a sheriff. <laughs> so much that he stopped providing essential public safety information to the reporters at our newspaper. Oh. Oh. I can't wait for the sequel. Oh, really. <laughs> I've also drawn cartoons criticizing a local state senator who caused a shameful statewide controversy recently after he was recorded. On rec I mean, he was, he was recorded. It was his voice. We didn't make it up. Uh, musing about religious executions of gay citizens. But instead of apologizing, the state senator staged a protest in front of the newspaper to accuse the cartoonist of telling lies and fake news. Here's the protest. <laughs> It wasn't as well attended as this room, but, <laughs> but that being said, they were real dadgum sweethearts. They're, we had a great time with it. But political cartoons, for, for all, all these reasons, as you can see, they're a special way to connect with the hearts and minds of readers. Uh, every so often, they inspire an anonymous gentleman in Des Moines. I don't know if you can see this to, to, to mail me these lovely handwritten handcrafted notes such as these. It's probably best you don't see the language on here if you're too far away. My, my wife asked me to blank it out, to be honest with you. Uh, and, and oftentimes, cartoons can become the morning top of the, topic of conversation with gadflies in the local diner. Uh, we're gonna check out this audio, bear with us, we're gonna see how it works. They sent, they sent all the to Cleveland. Yeah. Who, who's the master of cartoons? That was one of our, our many fans. Sorry if, you, if it was tough to hear that, but, uh, uh, but some mornings you even get voicemail to start your day off right. Well, what are y'all doing at the office today? I had a real good something I needed to tell Marley. So I'll go ahead and take it. I don't know how old that young punk is, but he's biased, closed minded, ball headed. And probably without hope for change. That equals out to an idiot. <laughs> I don't know how the hell y'all so liberal over here with the right there and all that military. <laughs> y'all need to get rid of him. He is pathetic, uneducated, and he's a young punk. I guess I've said that already. <laughs> I'm one of them. You're lucky, Daddy, that I don't get his extension. Because I'm going to let him have it when he gets back from the holidays. I hope you all have a nice day. And I'll be <laughs> I don't know if you did. That was leftover Christmas vacation, so. <laughs> um, um, but really, I mean, this is all part of the job. It's all part of the job. It's, it's part of the fun of the job at times. And, 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 and genuinely, you can ask my or you can ask Lisa. It, gen, usually, if you can get these folks on the phone, I mean, if, if, I, if I was there to pick up the phone, you could actually talk to them. By the end of it, we're best, we're, we can be best friends, no matter how far or what apart you come at the beginning. I, I truly believe that, uh, that you can be buddies by the end of it. But not, maybe not with everybody, because of all the folks who, <laughs> who react to political cartoons, there is a congressman who gets especially aggravated <laughs> when you draw, draw pictures of him like this.
Now, son, I just want this is a little bit of cartooning 101. I know you're a little young for, for this, but you know, if, if you get to this point one day, I hope you know. If you ever draw a picture of a congressman puckering up to a president's buttocks, please make sure to include Tic Tacs. <laughs> Manners are mandatory in the Marlette household, and fresh breath is simply polite, <laughs> even in cartoons. But I don't think our congressman was fond of this one either. I shall call him Mini-Me. <laughs> and uh, he, he especially did not like this one. This is a uh, young Matt's State of the Union day. <laughs> But in the grand scheme of things, cartoons are simply silly pictures and, and arrangement of lines, colors, and scribbles on, on a page and, and a blip in time, a momentary joke. Uh, they're nothing fancy, but they tend to upset sensitive people who take themselves too seriously. And in this case, the congressman was so upset, he called your dear old dad enemy of the people. Now, well, hopefully this particular congressman will not still be in office by the time you're old enough to vote. <laughs> but you never know, because this is the panhandle. <laughs> and, but, but son, when it comes time for that kindergarten career day, please don't tell the class that your father is the enemy of the people. <laughs> Because Lord knows throughout the swirling centuries of this weird, wild world, humanity has seen its share of very serious and very dangerous true enemies of the people. True tyrants who have wreaked havoc and unimaginable suffering on the innocent of this earth. I'm talking about men like the Emperor Nero and Adolf Hitler, and perhaps most of all, who can forget the guy who produced Backstreet Boys? <laughs> As history has proven time and time again, the true enemy of the people is always someone with power. The despotic rulers, the corrupt clergy members, the abusive industries, the humorless high school principals. We little old cartoonists, we aren't the enemy of the people. We are the people. We always have been, always will be. Now, in form, cartoons are rooted in the primitive power of mankind's first known folk art. Uh, there's simple lines on the cave wall of our community story. You know, our daily newspaper cartoons, they leave behind traces of our collective culture and history, our daily events, the things we witness in the world. Cartoons also have roots in the body bathhouse graffiti and art of ancient Rome. And they are loaded with the same spirit for staring down giants that are chiseled, chiseled deeply into the symbolism and meaning of the world's great masterpieces. And I would argue that there are many examples of Western civilization's most famous fine art that in form and meaning, I mean, are essentially powerful examples of editorial cartoon. It's after the park on shooting. But it, once you get beyond the bark and bite of a good political cartoon, and beyond the sarcasm on the veneer, and even behind the dark images like this, that are maybe sometimes more sad than funny, the fact is there's, there's optimism burning at the, the core of cartoons. You know, they're, they're premised on the faith that things can be better than they currently are, uh, that our government can be less corrupt, that our environment can be less polluted, that our community can be kinder and less violent, that we can simply have fewer assholes in places of power. Yes, yes. Cartooning is the official art form of childhood. It combines a playground sense of justice with childlike mischievousness to take on tyrants. Uh, Dr. Seuss famously attacked fascists in political cartoons years before he turned Hitler into a turtle. And it's that sort of uh, psychological link to childhood that gives this very rough and minimalistic art form a, a very simple line-based medium, profound emotional power. 
With just a few scratches of the pen and just a few well-chosen words, cartoons can force us to feel and think deeply about our lives. And for that reason, I think they can tap in to what's most pure about people. You know, all the marvelous instincts for silliness and imagination, all the stuff we're born with before we start trading away for, the, for all the shallow pieces of silver promised by adulthood, the success, the careerism, and yes, the cheesy congressional selfies. <laughs> so son, I promise you, cartoonists may be many things, but they are not the enemy of the people. What this congressman doesn't even realize is that people like him and their self-important, snowflake-sensitive protestations prove the point and purpose of political cartooning. Men like this show exactly why we need cartoons to help expose the phonies. So while this line of work may not be as glamorous or as financially rewarding or as esteemed and highly dignified as professions like lawyers, <laughs> or financial managers, or even as presidents, uh, cartooning is at least honest work. And so is the work done by all my colleagues at our little local newspaper here in Pensacola, and by so many journalists and newspapers all over this country. So while folks like this call us the enemy of the people, no matter what the guy who uses Sharpies on hurricane maps tells you, <laughs> we're not the fake news. We are not the enemy. We are reporters, photographers, editors, and even damn picture drawers who simply work to challenge and shed light on the commissioners, council members, sheriffs, and superintendents who have power over your lives and over your tax dollars. And if we don't do it, who will? It ain't the preachers doing it. It ain't the Rotarians. It ain't the real estate developers. And it sure ain't the industrial chemi chemical factory executives. Uh, we are not perfect as journalists, and we, we are often underpowered, but we give it hell and we try to hustle after the facts that folks in power would prefer us all to keep hidden. In a nation founded by folks who were brave enough to tell a king to kiss their ass, yeah. Yeah. it is our most essential American duty to pick on the people who are in power. We have to make fun of them, because in this country we should not chant and rally for public officials. We should not salute, stand, and applaud for politicians. And we sure as hell should not be paying them for merchandise, international golf outings, and luxury resort accommodations. But we should laugh at them. <laughs> because that laughter is an equalizer, balancing the power between us and them. The Washington Post says democracy dies in darkness. Well, it dies with, without irreverence, too. I, I know that's a long-winded way to explain what your old man does for a living, well, and, and I know you don't have a care in the world about congressmen or the con artists of their time, and may it always be so. But son, if the day ever comes where you have doubts about the sometimes dirty job of drawing political cartoons, just ask yourself one thing. Would the true enemy, enemy of the people be polite enough to draw Tic Tacs. <laughs> so guys, thank you so much for coming tonight. If, if anybody would like to, uh, to ask a few questions, if we have time for that, I'm not sure what we're scheduled for, I'd be glad to answer it. And, and uh, thank you so much for sitting through this.